what's going on everyone we're going to start in like one to two minutes just giving some people time to come in thanks for tuning in i think i'm getting a little performance anxiety what <laughs> you want to use your techniques tori you yeah, in the man, right you place better, better get that going <laughs> into the right place some game day grounding perhaps got it all I'm interested to know where everyone's coming from. If you want to type in the chat box, like what school you're from or yeah, I would love to know that what state you're from. We got a lot of different schools represented here. Long Island University. Long Island. Long Island. Welcome. Absolutely. It's good stuff. Bryn Mawr. We got a lot of Bryn Mawr. NYU. Oh, nice. University of South Carolina. They're going USC. so fast. I can't keep up. So fast. Stanford. Binghamton, Island, you, Columbia, Represent. Washington and Lee, Shenandoah, Kansas, Kansas State. State. We got, yeah, all sections of the country represent Berkeley, all time zones. Castleton. That's There's a lot of Castleton. The game students coming. Taro College. Columbia. Nice. <laughs> oh, we got two people from South Carolina. They had a big one. Football team had a big one over the weekend. Irvine, yeah, welcome. That's kind of in our backyard. It is. Ooh, you. Zot, zot. <laughs> University of Arizona. I went to UCI for undergrad, so. Oh, nice. Hey, what's up? How you doing? Awesome. All right, I think uh, yeah. I think we're ready to start. <clears throat> so what's going on, everyone? Welcome to Sports Like MD's first ever live show, Coping with COVID in College. I'm your host, Benjamin Vogel. With me today is Dr. Armin Host, Dr. Tori Trogio, and Dr. Ramey Eunice. We hope you all and your loved ones have been staying safe and healthy during this time. COVID-19 has affected every individual in some way or another. Personally, it wiped out the last four months of my time in college and ultimately shifted my graduation to an online Zoom. Currently, COVID-19 has drastically reshaped the landscape of the college lifestyle as we once knew it. For students like you, Going to a frat party or bar to blow off steam may no longer be an option. Congregating with your study group at your local coffee shop to try to study for next week's exam seems like a foreign concept. And student athletes are missing games and practices and are not able to play in front of packed stadiums. Times are tough and all the uncertainty, anxiety, stress and other mental health issues are skyrocketing. We don't know when things will get back to normal, but what we do know and what the goal of this show is is that staying mentally fit and healthy is not only critical for these times, but very practical. As a reminder, we will be recording this event to later publish the audio as episode 51 of Sports Like MDs, available on Spotify, Apple Music, and SoundCloud. We will first hear from Dr. Ramy Yunus, an infectious disease physician who will discuss COVID-19 and ways to live your normal lifestyle while being safe. Then Dr. Armin Hose, a board certified psychiatrist, and Dr. Tori Trogio, a child and adolescent psychiatrist will identify and define key psychological terms and mental exercises that we will mention throughout the show. The following segments will cover anxiety, stress, depression, sleeping and eating habits, and we got a miscellaneous section followed up by Q&As. Throughout the show, we will pull up visual graphics of mental exercises that you can try at home. Don't worry about copying them down or taking pictures of them as everything will be sent out in a later email. If you have any questions throughout the show regarding what we're talking about, please send them in the text box. And we will get to them at the end. So let's meet our team. First, Dr. Dr. Yunus, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ramey Yunus. I'm an infectious disease physician at UCLA. I'm originally from San Diego, went to UCLA for undergrad, then the University of Pittsburgh for medical school, then came back to Southern California to all of you UCLA for residency and ended up doing my infectious disease fellowship at UC Irvine. I see you, Irvine. Um, but now I'm a clinical instructor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine, and I'm in the Division of Infectious Diseases at UCLA. So I hope you guys find the session helpful. Absolutely. Dr. Hose. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Armin Hose. I'm a board certified, certified psychiatrist. Um, so I grew up in Maryland, uh, Columbia, Maryland to be exact, uh, which is a suburb of Baltimore. Uh, I went to the Air Force Academy uh, in Colorado Springs, Colorado for undergrad. 
Uh, I served uh, our country for about five years active duty before starting medical school at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Um, from Howard, I then attended UCLA for my psych psychiatry residency. And uh, since uh, finishing our, my psychiatry residency at UCLA, uh, I started my own private practice called Latitude Mental Health, which is based in Los Angeles. Uh, I also work for the Department of Mental Health uh, for Los Angeles County. And um, I am also a proud member of the Sports Psych MDs. <laughs> that leaves me. Hi, guys. I'm Dr. Tr Tori Trogio. So I grew up in Indiana, uh, did all my schooling there. I uh, went to Indiana University, go Hoosiers, um, then Indiana University for uh, medical school, and then made my way out to Los Angeles for residency, um, went to UCLA, Sepulveda campus, and then did a fellowship. Oh, I'm a psychiatrist, by the way, child and adolescent psychiatrist. And I did my fellowship training in child and adolescent psychiatry at Harbor UCLA. I currently am a um, psychiatrist working within LA County for the Department of Mental Health. And I also have a private gig on the side as well. And most importantly, I'm one of the two MDs at the Sports Psych MDs. Uh, Armin and I are both uh, sports psychiatrists. And I'm, I'm also do the Sports Psych MDs. I oh, only yeah. have a BA. I only have the BA though. So I graduated last year from uh, SUNY Binghamton. Saw so, uh, someone from Binghamton and uh, someone from Long Island. You may, you may know of it. So that's great. We're yeah. really excited. So. Our first segment covers COVID-19 and understanding the actual virus and implications, along with practical ways to live life as safe as possible. So Dr. Eunice, if someone tests positive for antibodies or if they already had COVID-19, does that mean they won't get it again? Um, that's a great question. It's a question that's been coming up a lot recently and the short answer is no. Um, we still don't fully understand how long immunity after COVID infection lasts, and we believe it's probably more likely on the order of months, not years. Um, and although it appears to be rare, there have been five cases of reinfection that have been reported. And granted, this is in the context of over 40 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide. So it does seem rare if it does happen, but because we don't fully understand how long immunity lasts, having COVID before does not give you a free pass to stop wearing a mask or you know, to go on and pretend like, you know, life is back to normal. Please keep wearing your mask and uh, washing your hands often, even if you've already recovered from COVID-19. Thank you. So for our runners in this, uh, in this show, if I'm running on a track or through the park and no one is around me, do I really need to wear a mask? <laughs> um, <laughs> I like this question. Um, if you're alone, especially outdoors, uh, it's okay to take off your mask. Remember that the reason why you're wearing a mask is to protect others as well as yourself. So if no one's around you, you're okay to take off your mask. But if you're on a trail and someone's heading towards you or a group of people happen to match your pace, slip on the mask until, you know, no one is in your vicinity and you should be good. Great. So uh, another question we have, if I've been in contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19, a friend or family member, how long should I wait to get tested? And while I'm waiting to get tested, what do I need to do to quarantine? Um, this is another good question. Um, I think that if someone finds out that they've been exposed to COVID-19, our gut reaction is to get tested right away because we're scared. We want to know if we've been exposed. But really, you may not detect the virus if you test too early. So what we've been suggesting is after your exposure, wait about seven to 10 days. I say a week just to, so it's easier to remember. Wait a week and then get swabbed. While you're waiting, it is really important that you quarantine for 14 days after the exposure event. And what I mean by that is just stay at home if possible. Please monitor yourself for symptoms. If you develop any symptoms, then by all means, go get swabbed at that point and see if you've actually have the disease in which case you may need to be isolated versus quarantine. Um, we can go into the difference about quarantine versus isolation if that comes up later. But essentially quarantine means if you've been expo potentially exposed, you kind of monitor yourself for symptoms. Isolation is what happens when someone who has the disease needs to be isolated from others, if that makes sense. Yeah, awesome, thank you. And for anyone who, if, if so, uh, that didn't make 100% sense for anyone, please write that in, in the chat and we'll, get, we'll either get to it right away or towards the end. But please, like we want to clear up any confusion. Don't, don't be afraid to ask any questions. So another question we have regarding COVID. If I want to socially distant hang out with my friends, what and how is the safest way to do that? 
Um, I think that the biggest, one of the biggest lessons we've all learned from COVID is the fact that we need each other. Um, we are social creatures. It's really difficult to feel isolated from loved ones for so long, and it I feels like there's no much. end in sight. Um, and this is rough on everyone, including providers and medical people. Um, there are a lot of creative answers to this question. I think I've heard that some patients have been doing virtual hangouts, some virtual workouts, happy hours, board game nights, virtually all of that. And obviously these are the, by far the safest options. But if you want to see friends in person, I would say wear a mask and go outdoors if possible. I know that as the weather gets colder in certain parts of the US, staying indoors is really not as feasible, but it's really important that or sorry, staying outdoors is not as possible, is not as feasible, but really try to avoid large group gatherings. I think that going for a socially distanced walk with a friend outside is reasonable. Um, you know, you have to try and keep yourself sane. You're not going to be a hermit all the time, but really try to avoid large indoor crowds or gatherings. Going to a crowded bar in the middle of winter um, is really not a good idea. And just, uh, just as a reminder for our guests, this is not a political show. We're speaking strictly <laughs> based on science, yes. science and facts. Absolutely. Uh, just uh, important to know that. So last question of this segment, it's very similar to the last question, to the previous question with a slight twist to it. Let's say my lifestyle requires me going outside, for example, jobs, schools, groceries, etc. How do I go outside, be amongst the general public and come back home to either my parents who are elderly or my friends without infecting them? Is there anything extra I can do? Um, yeah, a lot of what I said for the last question applies to this too, but again, when you're out and about, the most important thing you can do is wear a mask and then wash and sanitize your hands pretty frequently. Um, if you live with a loved one who's older or, or has you know, medical comorbidities, diabetes, whatnot, as soon as you get home, wash your hands. Um, a lot of people seem to be concerned about touching the mail or touching your groceries, but please keep in mind that infection from uh, surface contamination is much less common than person-to-person -person transmission. Um, you're much more likely to go and catch COVID inside in a crowded bar than you are from your bag of bananas. Um, you don't need to go crazy disinfecting every package, but when you're at home, um, if you're the only person going out, it's best if you can have your own bathroom and your own bedroom away from your elderly parents or relatives. And if you can, try to avoid sharing utensils and minimizing times in common spaces like the kitchen, just so that you can be as safe as possible if you're the only person leaving the house and running errands. I hope that makes sense. Awesome. Thank you. So moving on to the next segment. First, we want to identify and define key psychological terms and mental health exercises that you can practice, practice to combat stress, anxiety, and depression. So Dr. Trogio is going to discuss stress and anxiety, and then Dr. Hose will bring up depression. Dr. Trogio, the floor is yours. Absolutely. Thanks, Ben. Um, thank you, Dr. Eunice. Um, so I wanted to talk about anxiety and stress. They're kind of interchangeable, but specifically anxiety, it's, a, it's an emotion that we all feel, and it's characterized usually by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, um, and sometimes physical sensations, including like increased heart rate, which just so happens to be happening to me right now. Um, but the, in this, over time, sometimes can evolve into panic panic and panic is oftentimes when you get more of those physical sensations high blood pressure shakiness sweatiness feeling like you have a lump in your throat and anxiety is extremely common anxiety disorders um, people individuals who end up having distress or dysfunction from anxiety that's one in five people suffer from anxiety but everyone has anxiety at some point um, because anxiety is a normal process it's it's a normal natural part of our kind of what our body and our minds do. And that's because a, a certain level of anxiety can be good for us. Um, for example, like when we're worried about whether or not we're gonna do good on an exam, we may study kind of extra hard in order to be more prepared. So in that situation- Everyone has to be able to express themselves. You gotta roll with the punches. All right. You gotta roll with the punches. You're, so I don't know um, if we should let any more people in. Well, let's see. No, we gotta let people in. Yeah, let's do it. I've heard so you were in the middle of talking about your panic attack. <laughs> I've heard about that happening. I just haven't witnessed it. And that was intense. It all came at once. So, yeah. all right. So we were talking about anxiety. I was talking about how common it is. One in five people suffer from an anxiety disorder. And it's, a, but it's a natural thing. We all have it. It can be motivating for us. It can be fuel for us to actually 
get things done, um, like I mentioned before. Um, it only becomes a problem in an anxiety disorder when it begins to distract us from the moment and resulting in either distress or disruption in our ability to function. So I want to introduce kind of a little bit of neuroanatomy, if you bear with me. So we have essentially we have three components in our in our brains um, that control our functioning, and I just want to introduce two today. So we have the lower part of our brains. We, we have the amygdala, which is part of the emotions brain, and this is responsible for f the fight or flight system, um, or freeze. And and this is um, also a normal process that, that kind of evolved to sense danger and respond to a threat, um, kind of below our consciousness in, in like split seconds. So it holds this evolutionary purpose uh, in our ability to avoid predation. Just think about back in the day, if we were like out in the jungle and we had to avoid getting eaten by a tiger, we'd want to fight or flight or just freeze and play dead. Um, so with the fight or flight system, it essentially, anybody that's had a panic attack has noticed their fight or flight system kind of get activated. So what happens is you'll get an increased rate of breathing and that's an, it's in order to, bring more oxygen to your muscles, your heart will start beating out of your chest and that's in order to pump more blood to your muscles. You might get shaky or tense and that's because your muscles are starting to get ready to run away or to fight um, and you might begin to sweat and that's also preparing you to run away or to fight. So it's, it's, a, it's a mechanism that's important for us as humans. Um, not so much nowadays, although there's certain times where we need to get sprung into fight or flight in order to, to react, but the problem with this is that oftentimes it'll become hyperactive or it'll get triggered unnecessarily in individuals who are prone to anxiety or panic attacks. Um, so you'll have these same physiological reactions, increase heart rate, shakiness, sweatiness, but you're not needing to run from a tiger or fight a tiger off. Maybe you're just about to take a test or you're in the middle of a test or you're about to give a speech and all of a sudden you have this fight or flight reaction. And it's, it's, I use this analogy a lot. It's kind of like the amygdala or the fight or flight system is like a car alarm. Think of it as that. How many times have you guys heard a car alarm go off versus how many times they've actually seen someone breaking into a car? Usually the car alarm goes off. It's a far, false alarm. And unfortunately, a lot of times our amygdala or fight or flight system will go off and it'll be a false alarm. We don't, we don't need it to be going off at that time. So when it comes to managing your anxiety and managing your panic, it's a matter of first becoming aware that this is a normal process and that can go awry and you can have these false alarms. And then once you're aware, now, now you guys are kind of aware of that, you start to develop strategies to intercept this cycle because, because whenever you have these physical symptoms, your heart's beating out of your chest, your mind is like, what the hell is going on? And you start to freak out and that just pours fuel on the fire and your heart's going to start beating even more. You're going to get even more shaky. So we have to be able to kind of intercept this, this cycle to improve it. So I wanted to introduce um, kind of three new simple exercises that you can do that can, that can kind of start the process of being able to gain confidence in your ability to control your anxiety in any situation. Um, and these are kind of like general mental fitness techniques um, that, are, that can be helpful with a, lot of, a range of a lot of different things, including depression, but also specifically anxiety. Um, and the primary goal of these grounding exercises is to obtain mindfulness. You've probably heard that term before, but that's essentially being able to be completely present in the moment without judgment. We mentioned before that anxiety becomes an issue when it starts to distract you from the moment. Um, and mindfulness is key. That's like the antidote to anxiety and stress. So we'll start with these grounding exercises. I'm going to introduce three briefly. Uh, ben put up a, a sheet that, had, that shows the two that I'm about see to it? talk about. Um, if, I don't know if you can zoom in better. Yeah, I can see it. Um, yeah, so it looks, it looks good. The, the grounding exercise is a very simple exercise just to refocus your attention away from your anxiety and towards the current moment so you can gain back control. So deep breathing, extremely simple. You've probably heard of it, but this has a physiological effect in our body. So this will, deep breathing actually stimulates the vagus nerve, which reduces this fight or flight response. It tones down the amygdala, it tells the amygdala to relax a little bit. <clears throat> Um, and that helps decrease anxiety. It's actually been known to lower our um, heart rate by 10 points if you do this exercise. So you inhale through your nose four seconds, 
hold for five, exhale for six. And you'll see that online, if you, you research this, there's a bunch of different methods with different numbers, but the four, five, six method just kind of rolls off the tongue. Um, and you want to, you, you gradually start off doing just a few of these and you want to work yourself up to doing like eight total breaths or doing this for at least a minute. And that can put you in a really relaxed, calm state. Um, and maybe sometimes you don't have a full um, 10 minutes or minute to do this. So you, maybe you just want to do one deep breath um, in the four, five, six method, and that could help. The next one is probably my favorite is the engage all your senses, um, five, four, three, two, one. Um, so what you want to do um, when you, by heightening your awareness of your surroundings and your body, you can also heighten your awareness of the moment. So this is another great one. So what you do is you name out loud or to yourself, or you write it down if you have, have that ability, five things you can see. Um, this is specific, the examples here are specifically rated, related to sports, but this can, you can do this anytime. My personal favorite is to go on a, uh, on a walk and do this five, four, three, two method. So name five things you can see, name four things you can feel, name three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. So this is really great to really put yourself in the moment. And, and like I said, it's my personal favorite. And when you describe these things in your head or whether you're writing it down, try to be as specific as possible. Um, and then the last one, we don't have a handout for this one, but so I'll talk about it just very briefly, is called progressive muscle relaxation. And this is based on the simple practice of tensing up and tightening one muscle group at a time, followed by relaxing it and releasing that tension. It's really helpful to understand how much anxiety and stress we hold in our bodies and our muscles. Um, so what we do, what you do, it's, it, this can not only be helpful for anxiety, but it's also helpful for headaches. It can be helpful for pain, high blood pressure, it, stomach issues, sleep issues. I think Ben will touch on this later as a technique to help with falling asleep. But you, you kind of do some deep breathing with this as well. You, you'll in, while you're inhaling, you contract, contract one muscle group usually you want to start from either the top down or the bottom up. Um, so you maybe you're flexing both your biceps at one, at one time. And as you inhale for, for five seconds, five to 10 seconds, and then you release and you let them relax. The key to this is once you tense up and then you relax, then you kind of notice, oh, that's what a relaxed muscle feels like. And you may notice that you've been holding a lot of tension in your muscles. So we can, we can provide you guys with a handout on, on how to do this directly, but essentially you do that and you, like you said, you either work yourself up from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom. And trust me, you're going to feel, feel relaxed after that. So those are kind of three quick, easy exercises. Um, and we'll talk about later specifically how you can adapt those to do those like in the moment while you're taking a test or when you, you have a stressful thought about like COVID or something. Um, but those are really easy things to kind of put you in the moment and, and free you from the anxiety. Awesome. I, I love the uh, engaging your senses exercise. I think that's super practical. I think I mean, we were talking about this earlier in the show, but I mean, like if I'm a student, I'm about to take a test, like, like test days can be super stressful and whatnot. And that's such a simple and easy way to like com to combat that test anxiety when you're in the testing room, you just like five things you see, five, like four things you hear. What, like, um, what, what do I even taste like i'm tasting like gum or whatever it's so simple and practical and hopefully you guys y'all can benefit from this too so dr hose can you um yes. can you give us a little little intro to depression i sure can and uh thanks a lot tori that was tremendous um i even learned a lot during that and uh, i think uh, everyone else did too um so depression um man so this is uh, a uh a a condition that I think is pretty difficult to define, honestly, um, on, on one hand, because depression is something that really everyone experiences in different ways. Um, and it, it's, it's a symptom, right? It's a symptom. It's something we feel it's not always a disease. Um, and, uh, when, uh, depression as a symptom evolves into something that really disrupts our ability to kind of function and feel like our our normal self, like, you know, in terms of our ability to, to do the things that we normally do uh, at the, the pace and at the, the sort of um, level uh, that we're used to doing them, then it can become a disease. And it, then we think of it more uh, as a mental health condition. But uh, in general, 
uh, all of us have a bad day. You know, all of us, um, you know, have things going on in our lives, whether it be, you know, in our social lives, you know, we have a, a breakup, right? Or, you know, we have, uh, you know, a bad test score and, or we have a family issue, you know, something going on back home or COVID-19, you know, something like that. Like we can definitely feel a certain way about it that, that just kind of makes us feel um, sad, uh, maybe lonely and isolated. Um, maybe just, you know, we can't really focus on the tasks at hand and instead we're kind of just, uh, you know, worried about things that maybe don't matter as much. Um, you know, maybe we're stuck on something from the past, uh, some regret. In, in either case, we can experience depression. And um, I challenge you guys, though, to think about depression uh, less as a form of sadness, um, but really more as, a, as it relates to energy, energy, okay? Um, and particularly when we have energy deficit. Um, and, you know, energy really kind of works two ways primarily, right? We have physical energy uh, and that's just kind of like, you know, getting up in the morning and, you know, and feeling like energized and feeling strong and healthy. Um, and then there's also mental energy, right? And mental energy, of course, is our ability to concentrate and focus, get through an exam, study hard, all those good things. That's kind of our mental energy. Well, with depression, it's kind of like a a combination of both physical and mental energy, let's call it emotional energy. And emotional energy refers to uh, the balance and regulation of our thoughts and our decisions, right? That's really what our emotional system, our emotional state is. It's the regulation, the ability to regulate and control our thoughts, you know, and how we perceive things, how we interpret things, uh, and then ultimately the decisions that we, that we make, you know, in our behaviors, right? So uh, a healthy emotional state uh, is all about balance. It's all about balance and, and flexibility. Uh, when we have balance, it means that we're not going to get too high, uh, you know, and, and just sort of like overexcited or anxious or manic, you know, in terms of just being, being kind of out of control and overly exuberant about something. And um, we're also not going to get too low because uh, we're going to sort of be able to maintain confidence and self-assuredness despite whatever challenges may come. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's really about uh, a, a sort of ability to kind of just roll with the punches, um, you know, understand that problems are going to come in life, you know, challenges are going to be there, but we can assert a certain amount of control over how we choose to think about those problems and how we relate to those problems, which really does give us a level of, of um, power over the plan for how we will address those problems. Um, and when we have these things and we have them on a higher level and there are things that we can really almost like as a toolkit fall back on and utilize moment to moment to get through our days and, and, you know, get through our challenges in life, we tend to not have to experience depression, particularly as a disease. Um, another thing I want to say about depression is that, um, you know, when you have depression as a symptom, meaning, you know, something where you're just kind of having a bad day, you're feeling sad about something. If, you know, you, you have a day or two that, you know, where you don't really feel like yourself, that's fine. You're going to get through that. And I think a lot of the things that we're talking about today can be super helpful for that. Um, however, when a depression in terms of, a, you know, just kind of not feeling like our best, not having that like kind of typical mental and physical energy that we're used to having, when that evolves into uh, a feeling of, let's say, hopelessness, despair, uh, worthlessness, and those feelings uh, become persistent, start to affect uh, our ability to really 
uh, let's say, enjoy hanging out with our friends and, and loved ones, family, um, enjoy the process of learning in school and doing well in our classes, uh, when it starts to uh, prevent us from wanting to even get up, you know, from bed in the morning and, you know, just get through the day, when those kind of things are happening, particularly when they happen over the period of maybe weeks, that's when it's probably a disease. And frankly, these techniques are unlikely to be to be particularly helpful. And, and it's probably time to consult a professional. And we call that condition major depressive disorder. Um, major depressive disorder is sort of like the, uh, you know, depression on steroids, uh, no pun intended. It's um, really a scenario where uh, we just really don't have the ability uh, on our own strength to, uh, to kind of get ourselves out of that funk and where uh, things like therapy, psychotherapy, um, and things like medications may be the, the, the ways to go. Um, COVID-19 is, uh, as all of you probably would, would uh, recognize, um, has really been a game changer for the whole world. I mean, we've seen it on the media uh, or in the media, um, in the news, like all the different ways in which this pandemic has really transformed society um, all the tragedies, you know, the social injustices that we've seen. And, you know, I could almost look at COVID-19 as being uh, a general depression for this entire country in a lot of ways in terms of how it's manifested. And so there's no doubt that um, mental fitness techniques, like the ones we're going to discuss today, can really be helpful for enabling us to not really focus so much on COVID-19 as this thing, you know, this, this thing that, you know, we're, we're never going to be able to, to get around or uh, this thing that's going to destroy us as a society, but we rather focus on what we can do as individuals to get through it, to weather the storm, uh, and also find hope in the things that we do have in our lives that do bring us strength and pleasure and, and ultimately, um, you know, enable us to have a vision to create a clear vision for the future that we want to have so that, you know, as this pandemic resolves itself and it, it will absolutely do that. And once we get the treatments that we need, we can just, you know, uh, we won't necessarily go back to life exactly how it was, but we can create uh, a new and even better life for ourselves, um, you know, as the, the future draws on. I want to share with you today um, a few mental fitness strategies that can really help with at least, like I said, kind of general day-to-day -day lower level depression symptoms. Um, one in particular is gratitude. Gratitude. Gratitude as not just a feeling uh, of thankfulness, but uh, as a practice and how you can practice gratitude and make it work for you. So um, gratitude, I think, is something that really has to be done actively in order for it to work for you. And the way it works actively is it has to be communicated. That's either verbally or by writing it down. And one way of, of kind of doing this as a routine is, say, you wake up in the morning and you write down all the things that you are thankful for, uh, the people in your life that are maybe a support group that you really believe are uh, a positive force for you. Um, and, uh, you know, even the things that maybe you plan to do that day that are things that are pleasurable, just write it down, you know, take five minutes to do this. And then at night, um, you know, some people like to say their prayers. I would say, write down your thoughts, write down the things that happened that day that were great, you know, that were positive, that brought you a sense of joy. And, you know, do this as a regular exercise. Um, verbally would be reach out to somebody that you care about um, and have a conversation with them, but not just about regular stuff. Let them know, hey, I appreciate you. I appreciate what you've done for me. I appreciate your, your place and your presence in my life. And let that be known. Um, you know, if maybe you, you've had some sort of like, negative encounter with someone 
uh, something you may regret, you know, or wish had been different, reach out to that person to have a conversation. Uh, let them know how you feel um, and say, hey, you know, I wish that had been different. Um, I, especially this is somebody that you do care about that at one time was an important person in your life. Say, hey, you know, um, let's, let's get back on track. You know, that's, this is not really who we are. These are things that are practical ways of demonstrating gratitude that I, I promise can provide a source of very positive energy that can get you out of a funk, um, you know, when times are tough. Gratitude is one thing. Uh, there's another uh, strategy we call behavior activation. Behavior activation. Now, I just want to say, depression and anxiety are actually very similar conditions, even though they're different parts of the brain are involved in these conditions and these disease processes. Um, and they certainly feel different to the person that's experiencing them, but they're very similar. And I would almost go as far as to say that, first of all, both of them are emotional disturbances. But with anxiety, think about that as almost like uh, your emotional balance being kind of sped up um, and uh, depression being when your emotional balance is sort of like slowed down and when you feel stuck. Um, so behavior activation is a way to kind of get unstuck, right? And oftentimes we get stuck when we have like recurrent challenges, things in our lives that we maybe try to do, um, but they just don't work out the way that we want them to challenges we've had that just kind of continue to be challenges and we just don't really seem to know how to get over the hump. Well, behavior activation is basically a way of creating um, motivation and creating a, a plan around things that uh, really create more of a positive reinforcement system for ourselves, positive reinforcement. The difference between positive and negative reinforcement primarily is um, really how we sort of like orient our thinking around how to problem solve. Um, now we can avoid something bad. We can avoid something that's not pleasurable. And by avoiding it, we get a positive benefit out of that. We're not experiencing that bad thing. But with avoidance is that it's never really going to get you um, any progress, right? It's going to get you kind of to ground zero, um, maybe to like a neutral state, but it's not really going to move the ball forward for you. When you focus on things that are, um, and, and actually like directly confront things that are the problem, but you focus more on the things that are constructive, and that um, are really things you can control, uh, things that are um, positive and can lead to positive outcomes, that's when you, I think, oftentimes can, can gain control of a situation. So it's about shifting away from our negative thoughts about what's happening with something we, you know, a problem that we have in our lives and focusing on the things that we really can control and then creating a plan of action um, that is oriented around the things that, um, you know, really will put us in the driver's seat, put us in a position to be successful. And that's what behavior activation is all about. You know, things like creating a, a schedule um, that we can actually stick to because it works for us and not against us. So a sensible schedule. Um, you know, that's one way to, um, to get positive reinforcement. I want to uh, direct you guys to a particular strategy called, uh, this is about goal setting and goal achievement. It's called smart goal setting and then smarter goal achievement. So Ben is sharing his screen. Smart is actually um, a mnemonic device and it's a way of kind of setting and achieving goals or setting goals in a way that uh, make them more achievable and yield positive results and enable us to kind of like filter out things that we can't really control in situations. Um, so we're focused on the problem and not so much on our feelings about the problem. 
So uh, S for specific. So that means we always want to uh, really be very, very targeted in our approach to what we want when, we ha when we're trying to set a goal. Um, measurable, so we, we want uh, to be able to track our progress. So uh, let's say a measurable meaning, what can I do in a day? What can I do in a week? What can I do in an hour, right? Make it measurable, don't just make it random. Uh, attainable, so make it, you know, something that we really can actually uh, achieve based on the, the, the tools that we have available um, rather than something that may be out of reach. Uh, obviously, for example, if you're trying to, to do better in a particular class on a particular exam, it's not going to happen overnight. It's about all of the hours and days leading up to that exam um, that you're preparing in order to get it right, and it may take an entire semester. Um, but make, them, make those goals attainable and then realistic. So, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, we find ourselves maybe putting too much pressure on ourselves to do things that, um, you know, are, are beyond our, our scope. And there's really never going to be anything positive that comes from that because we really want to do things according to our strengths and our limitations. So be honest with yourself, right? Um, know what you can do and do that. And then once you've done that, build upon it, build upon that positive energy, that positive reward that you get from that accomplishment to get to the next goal. You've heard of baby steps. Momentum. Right? You've heard of baby steps. Baby steps are good. It's all about progress forward. Uh, oftentimes, if you take too big, too, too big of, a, of, a, of a chunk of something and bite off more than you can chew, and you lose, you fail, that creates a setback. That sets you down a path of a negative reinforcement. We want positive energy and positive motivation. And then make these things time sensitive, you know. Um, give yourself a deadline. Uh, always give yourself a deadline. Whenever you have a goal you're trying to achieve, always give yourself a deadline. And if you don't achieve that goal within that, that deadline, don't get down to yourself. Uh, actually, Give yourself positive energy for what you have accomplished. Reward yourself for the effort and then reset. Reset the bar for the next time. Readjust so that you give yourself more time to accomplish that, that goal the next time around. So that's, uh, that's a, a particular strategy that you can use to just um, get more out of your experiences day to day and, again, generate more positive energy for yourself. And... Um, yeah, I said, you know, gratitude, behavior activation, and basically along the same lines, problem-focused coping. Problem-focused coping. So, you know, when, we're, when we see something Herman. that's not going right, uh, and I'll, I have about 20 seconds left, when something's not going right, what you want to do is you don't want to focus on how you feel about something. You don't want to get down on yourself. You want to just attack the problem, you know, and you want to find the different ways within there that uh, you can make a difference so that you can take control. Thank you for that, Armin. So on to the next segment. So we're going to be discussing anxiety. And anxiety can manifest itself in various ways, including performance and test anxiety. Individuals can be at the top of their games athletically or academically, yet their performance and test anxiety can negatively, interf can negatively interfere with their in-game or in-class performance. This segment will address performance and test anxiety along with practical ways to combat these issues in order to achieve peak performance. So first, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna direct this question to Dr. Hose. How do you deal with performance anxiety, especially when you feel like, you are, especially when you feel like you're losing the best years of your life? And I know you wanted to mention uh, the importance of mindfulness, but also the importance of simulate the testing environment. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so it's, um, you know, practice how you're going to play, practice how you're going to perform. So, you know, ultimately there, um, as you're going through your, you know, sort of preparation phase. So once you get to the point of the day of, of you know, the test day, I would say just pop a propanolol uh, and try to get through that. No, I'm just, <laughs> um, but, you know, honestly, though, it really starts from the, uh, the preparation phase. So you want to map out Maybe if you have a week, two weeks or whatever, how much time you have, 
before the exam, you want to really ultimately prepare, uh, have like a daily approach, a daily study strategy. And, um, you know, you want to ultimately like create conditions. So the environmental conditions that you're going to test in. Um, so if you know you're taking that exam at a certain time, let's say in the morning, um, you want to make sure that you get a great night's sleep the night before that exam. So you should be getting a great night's sleep, let's say eight hours a night, every single night uh, before that exam. Um, you know, you want to, you know, for example, if caffeine is something that, um, you know, you, you know, is going to probably affect your sleep, I would definitely not take any caffeine, consume any of that, any coffee, anything, anything like that uh, the night before the exam or, you know, any really nights leading up to the exam. Um, you want to, you know, prepare in a controlled environment that is similar to the environment that you're going to actually take the exam in. And um, you want to have a, a very consistent diet. Um, and, you know, whatever you're consuming, generally, whatever you, you eat, day to day, you want to make sure you, you eat those you know, similar things leading up to the exam. So it's just really about, I think, uh, um, creating conditions for preparation that are going to be similar to the conditions in which you test in. Thank you. So next question we have is for Dr. Trogio. Um, I'm oh. just curious, like, yeah? No, keep going. Okay. Uh, no, so how, how does someone handle and deal with the anxiety of the unknown slash COVID? Yeah, we had, on that. I mean, that's, that's a great question because what is it, the past like eight months we've been dealing with this unknown lingering all around us essentially. So it all comes down to trying to just control what you can control, control the controllables. Armin mentioned this before. Um, we're not going to be able to predict when a vaccine is going to be available. We're not going to be able to predict when things are going to be back to normal. But what we can do is we can get up each and every day and, and do... Um, do two, two things that fall into two different categories. Do things that we know are helpful for everyone to do. So that means getting up, showering, brush your teeth, eat a healthy diet, get some exercise in, make your bed, get a good night's sleep. Those are things you can do that are going to be helpful regardless. And then other things that you can do, um, and those things help kind of create that momentum and that routine like Armin was talking about before. The second category would be things that are consistent with your values. For example, I value my relationship. So maybe every day, I tend to those relationships every day. Maybe I'll send a text out or I'll give someone a call that I care about and just have a chat with them. I don't necessarily have to tell them, hey, I care about you, but I'll, I'll tend to those relationships because I care about those things. And, and those are things that we can control. Um, and the last thing, but the most important thing, regardless of what's going around on around you, you can try to control your attitude. So really, like Armin mentioned before about um, trying to about gratitude. Um, that's a great way to try to give yourself a positive attitude. And if you can wake up every day and try your best to, to practice these gratitude exercises and you can put yourself in this, this positive state of mind and have a positive attitude, then that's one step in the right direction because ultimately you can control that and that you can control that by doing all these things that we've talked about. So just focus on the things you can control. So just control the controllables. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So last question of this anxiety segment. This one goes to both of you guys. Um, how, do, how do I or someone push through performance anxiety both before and in the moment? So I, I talked a little bit about this earlier, but we talked about this deep breathing. And I don't know if you want to pull up that sheet again, but you can do like, let's say um, that you, you walk into your exam and all of a sudden you get anxious or you have an anxious thought, just do one of those deep breathing exercises, do a single deep breath. And you'd be surprised how that, how helpful that can be. And this is something like Armin mentioned before, you want to practice these things. You don't want to go into your exam and that's the first time you do deep breathing. No, you want to be able to, you want to practice these things almost every day. So you know that they're helpful, you know that they work and you have to find something that works best for you. So if you notice on this handout on the orange column, there's a really quick, quick thing called game day grounding that we came up with. It essentially combines engaging all the senses in deep breathing. So you take one deep breath using the four, five, six method. You use your, your vision, you pick out one anchor, make sure it's easily viewable when you're taking the test or say you're, 
you're performing, you're playing your sport. Maybe it's an article of clothing, maybe it's a piece of jewelry, maybe it's a tattoo, maybe it's something you pick out in, in the room, but something that you can bring your sight to whenever you feel anxiety coming and that can anchor you in, in, into the moment. Um, and then use your ears and listen for a recurrent sound and try not to judge that sound. Maybe you listen to the clock ticking or the AC unit. Um, and then use your sensation, use your, your, feel your body, feel your, sh your feet and your shoes and your shoes on the ground. And then do one last uh, four, five, six breathing method. And if you do that, you can do this, this anywhere. That's the beauty about these grounding exercises. You can do them absolutely anywhere. And something like this is not, is maybe going to take what, 30 seconds. So you can definitely get away with doing this and it can be really helpful. So I, I would um, try it out. I, I was doing this when we got hacked earlier. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. I mean, to, to piggyback off what Tori says, I mean, I've actually been practicing deep breathing and, and progressive, progressive muscle relaxation exercises ever since college. Um, I had a really cool instructor that taught me these things and they really do help in the moment just to kind of make you feel better, make you feel more calm. But you also mentioned what you can do kind of like in like before the event or before you have to perform. Um, and I, I really like the the engaging your senses, you know, like the visualization and stuff. I really like that because what you're really doing when you you perform visualization the right way is you're you're creating a mental map of success and you're it actually is very much in line with how our brains function if we think about things in a way that enables sort of more detail and in a very methodical and structured way sort of like from point a to point b to point c to point d in terms of like first of all putting ourselves not in the third person position of like watching ourselves in our mind do something but actually us being the ones doing you know the the work of either the studying or if we're athletes you know the the the, the you know we're working on our shot like the whole work going through the whole thing from start to finish the more detail about the environment about our bodies about the shot about the ball all the more detail we can create uh, the more structure we can create to that thought exercise, that mental map that we're creating, the more motivated our brain becomes to really creating that visual and ultimately motivating that behavior to come to fruition. So um, I really like visualization and, and engaging the senses in general. Um, you got to put in the work. You know, it's not something that you just can do like one time for like five minutes expected to to be meaningful. It's got to be like an everyday thing, maybe for, you know, five, 10 minutes, and then maybe multiple times a day, the more detail we can create around it, the better. Um, but yeah, I like that for preparation. Okay, great. So on to the next segment, similar to anxiety, stress can manifest itself in various ways. And stress can interfere with an individual's in game performance. If a student, athlete or individual is too stressed, it can take over their ability to focus during lectures, games, school, or just everyday life. So this segment is going to address stress along with practical, practical ways to relieve stress in order to achieve your peak performance on the field, in the classroom, or just in life in general. So a question I have is how does someone deal with stress in general, but especially now with online school and isolation? Earlier you said you were, you were going to discuss about the importance of connecting with others, behavioral activation, which you brought up earlier in the show. Yeah. I mean, yeah, at a time like this, man, I, I think honestly, like social connection is just so important, you know, and obviously, you know, you got the social distancing thing, you know, you, you, you don't want to have like a packed room, like a party kind of thing. Um, but, you know, you know, maybe the ones that are closest to you, the people you really trust and you, you know, you really spend time with in general, the most making sure you're staying connected, but, not just again talking about like random stuff or whatever like sharing how you feel you know like sharing what's going on back home you know if you have a loved one that's been affected back home a family member like you know open up you know i think transparency uh about how we truly feel and having people in our lives that are willing to receive that and be non-judgmental about it but just listen and be willing to learn and just kind of empathize that's huge, you know, it's huge at a time like this. 
Thank you. So on to the next segment. According to the American Psychological Association, depression affects 36.4% of college students. Most people with depression find that their motivation levels drop, which can carry severe negative side effects, especially if someone has an obligation. For instance, a midterm to study for and take. So Dr. Host, when someone feels like they're in a funk or a depressive state, how can they stay motivated? Um, yeah, you know, I think it just comes back to, I'll say behavior, back, behavior activation is, is one really solid way, but you know, just to kind of put that in perspective a little bit, it's like we all have things we love to do, right? We all have things we enjoy doing. It could be video games. It could be, you know, um, I don't know, hanging out with friends, socializing. It could be, uh, you know, certain foods that we like, you know, certain hobbies like, you know, some people may like to, you know, do Tai Chi. <laughs> you know, some people may like, you know, to do yoga. I mean, whatever it is. You know, I would say just do more of that, but most importantly, do it with a purpose and with a plan, right? So with what I mean by that is create a uh, sort of an action plan in which you're able to really do these things consistently, uh, like say, every, you know, every day, every other day, whatever the case may be, um, a time of day that actually works for your schedule where you're not disrupting other things, um, do it with friends, you know, people that also enjoy it, where you guys can kind of pick each other up and elevate each other and um, do it with uh, a, a purpose around getting better. Right? There's nothing more, I think, uh, fulfilling than doing something we enjoy and doing it well. So I would just say do more of that. Simple Great. enough. So we've all heard about the importance of a good night's sleep and a well-balanced meal. But what happens if you can't fall asleep? I think everyone can relate to that. You know, there's some nights where you just can't fall asleep and you're just tossing and turning. Or what if you don't know where the right foods to eat? I know some college students, you know, sometimes it's not always uh, cost efficient to get the healthier meal. Um, sleep deprivation can cause individuals to have a harder time concentrating, learning, and communicating. While poor nutrition can lead to fatigue, dehydration, and poor health. So in this segment, we're going to address sleeping and eating exercises. So Dr. Trogio, how yeah. do you sleep better? So this is common complaint um, that we hear all the time. What I always talk about, and Ben, I don't know if you have that image of the sleep hygiene techniques. I just want to go over these, what we call sleep hygiene techniques, just techniques for better sleep One second. that anyone can do. And you don't need a medication. Obviously, we prescribe medications for sleep, but they're, those aren't ideal. Those aren't going to actually help you. They're just Band-Aid approaches. These techniques are, are extremely helpful. So um, basically, it boils down to you want to keep a consistent sleep schedule, get up at the same time every day, even on the weekends or during vacations. We know that's not necessarily real, realistic for a college kid. Um, I was once there, and you like to sleep in past noon at times. But ideally, you try to stay consistent with regards to your sleep schedule. You want to try to set a bedtime early enough to get at least seven hours. Um, people in their early 20s technically need more than that, eight or nine hours. Um, one thing that people don't know is you don't want to go get into your bed unless you're tired. So even if you set a bedtime, but if you're not tired, you shouldn't get in bed. You should not spend more than 20 minutes in bed if you're, if, unless you're sleeping. So if you try to get in bed and you don't, it's been 15, 20 minutes, and you're still awake, tossing, and turning, get up, get out of bed and go do something that is relaxing to you um, and something that doesn't involve a computer screen, an iPhone, a TV, read a book, drink a warm glass of milk, do something like that. But don't spend, the bed is only for sleeping. It should only be for sleeping and sex. You shouldn't be studying in your bed. And I know that's difficult if you live in a dorm, but really try to not be sitting or laying in your bed unless you're trying to sleep or unless you're getting down. Um, so try to make your, your bedroom, your place to relax and, and try to keep a cool temperature. Maybe limit your exposure to these, these cell phones. I know a lot of them have the, the night filters, which are good, but try to really limit these, um, within that last hour of bed, um, avoiding alcohol, avoiding too many fluids at night. That'll get you up to go to the bathroom, avoiding caffeine in the afternoon. I know that you, a lot of people are study at night and will sometimes pull all-nighters um, 
Sometimes you, you just have to do that. Ideally, ideally, you don't. Ideally, you listen to what Armin said earlier and you study a little bit each day and you come up with a plan a couple of weeks out from each test. But we want to give you guys practical advice. Just know that when you're up at night and you're not sleeping, your body specifically makes hormones when you're sleeping that inhibit hunger. So when you're not sleeping, that hunger is going to be there. And what's available when you're up at night studying, it's usually vending, vending machines and and uh, junk food. So if you are going to pull an all night or if you're going to stay up late, which sometimes you just have to, or I understand it, try to um, pack or create a healthy snack beforehand so you don't run to the vending machine for some Doritos or something. Um, so those are the main things um, to look out for. Um, yeah. Thank you. So now I want to I want to bring up uh, two sorry um, two sleep two sleeping exercises. Uh, two sleeping exercises called the military method and uh, the military method and or now I lost it. These are very similar to the breathing method methods we talked about before and the progressive muscle relaxation methods. Yeah. They're so extremely we helpful. Had the sleep, sleep. We got two sleeping exercises. The first is a deep breathing. We call this the 478 breathing method. And the first thing you want to do is you want to place the tip of your tongue behind your upper front teeth. Next, you want to exhale completely completely through your mouth, sort of making a whoosh sound. And then you want to close your mouth and inhale through your nose while mentally counting to four. Then you're holding your breath and you want to mentally count to seven before opening your mouth and exhaling completely, making a whoosh sound and mentally counting to eight. And then you want to repeat the cycle three times. And again, we're going to be sending this and all the other templates out in an email. So don't worry about copying this down or taking a picture of it. I mean, you can if you want. Next, the next uh, sleep method is called the military method, where you want to first relax your entire face, including the muscles inside your mouth. Then you want to drop your shoulders to release tension and let your hands drop to the side of your body. Then you want to exhale to re relax your chest. And then you want to relax your legs, thighs, and calves. Then you want to clear your mind for 10 seconds by imagining a relaxing scene. And then just repeat to yourself for 10 seconds, don't think, don't think, don't think. It sounds... It sounds silly, but this works. So Dr. Trogio, what are some physical health and nutrition suggestions that I can focus on? Yeah, so I'm not a nutritionist and, and dietary things are so specific to the individual. So I don't want to get caught up and there's not a blanket or approach, approach that everyone can take when it comes to nutrition. But there are certain things that I think we all know. Um, like I mentioned before, if you're going to pull an all nighter, you're going to be hungry. So pack something healthy. Um, usually you you go for those like high carb high sugar foods because they give you bursts of energy but it's not sustainable in the long run so a good substitute for, for that would be like fruit it's better for you and it'll still give you that energy um, what you really want to do is try to obviously vegetables foods that are high in fatty acids dark leafy greens nuts seeds beans stuff like that's going to give you more sustained energy um, just try to avoid like processed foods at this point, you probably know what does and doesn't work for your body. Like Armin was saying earlier, if you know that if you go eat Mexican food, you're going to have like bad stomach issues. Don't eat that the night before an exam or, or don't have, if you usually wake up and have a coffee and some granola for breakfast, don't all of a sudden go to Denny's and get a grand slam bacon and the ham. Like just know yourself, know what works and um, you'll be ready to go. Thank you, Dr. Trogio. So, now, moving on to our next segment, this is sort of like the miscellaneous segment. We got a lot of questions from the Google form. Also, thank you guys so much for filling out the, the Google form and sending out like what topics you, what topics or questions you want to be covered. So first question I think is extremely prevalent for everyone around here. And I, all three of you guys can answer. When meeting with a psychologist, psychiatrist, physician, or really a doctor, what are the best practices for a telehealth? How do I make it work the best way possible? So we're doing telehealth like crazy out here in Los Angeles. So there's definitely, if you need to see someone, whether it's a regular physician or a therapist or a psychiatrist, they should be doing telehealth. They should have it be set up. So don't be hesitant to reach out to a clinic, give them a call and ask them if they're doing telehealth. And when you get it all set up in your room, just try to have decent lighting, probably better than what I have right now, um, a good screen and yeah, it's just pretty much go from there. Yeah, I mean, I guess best practices. I would to kind of just kind of treat it like a like a business meeting. You know, it's uh, and it's kind of what it is. You know, I mean, no one's 
you know, there to play games, you know, it's about really helping you through whatever is you're going through, whatever challenges and, and you know, you want to be in a position to be able to get the most out of that hour, hour and a half, however long you have. It's probably only a weekly thing, bi-weekly thing, or maybe even a monthly thing. So you want to make the most out of it. So be prepared, be on time, um, have questions prepared and, you know, get those questions answered. And um, yeah, I mean, with all the technologies we've had, we have nowadays with like Zoom and different things, like I feel like, um, you know, we have great audio signals and, and good high quality video. So I think just technology has enabled us to really have great signal and great, uh, you know, sort of communication yeah. formats. So I'll, just make I'll, the most out of it. Also make sure to find privacy, a quiet room. That's important as well. For sure. Right. Dr. Choju, I know you wanted, uh, you, you, you wanted to take this one. What is the, and I'm sorry, how do you overcome the mental block of playing with a mask on? So that's interesting. If, if certain sports, I've, I think I've seen some tennis matches somewhere on the internet where people are wearing masks, but I feel like most professional sports are not wearing masks. I'm not sure exactly. And most college sports are not necessarily having to wear a mask while they're actually participating just on the sidelines. But what we touched on all along is just practice. If you have to wear a mask while you're playing in a game, or if you have to wear the mask while you're taking a test, I had to take my child an adolescent psychiatry board exam recently. We had to wear masks during the exam. So if that kind of throws you off, practice wearing the mask. So practice your craft wearing the mask, study wearing the mask. It sounds silly, but just to get used to it. If you're going to be sitting there taking a test with a mask on for four hours, or if you're playing baseball with a mask on, then you should be practicing that with a mask on. I and I would say to too, simulating the environment. I'll say too, there are actually some more like higher quality masks out there nowadays that have been designed. I'm going to throw one up in particular that I recently got called Halo Mask. And it was a little more expensive. It's like maybe 30 bucks, but honestly, I breathe great in it. It's somehow they've created the filters necessary to enable you to still kind of really breathe almost like normally, um, but still, you know, more or less prevent, you know, the, the transmission of just like any normal mask would. This is not, by the way, the level of like the, you know, the, the hospital CDC level masks um, that, you know, Dr. Eunice uh, would uh, would tell you to wear. Uh, Dr. Eunice, I wanted to ask you, what, what are your, what's a, pro like, can I wear a bandana? What about those uh, gainers that people wear? Like, what are your thoughts on appropriate mask wear? Um, they actually did a couple of good studies on this and uh, gaiters or bandanas really were not very protective. In fact, gaiters tended to, you know, actually promote condensation. So they actually were worse off wearing the gaiter than they were wearing a regular surgical mask or something else. So if you have like a regular surgical mask um, that you can buy, I think they're selling them at Costco and other stores now, those are actually really good protection. The problem is they can get wet and once they get wet, they're really useless. Um, if you are going to work out in a mask, um, some of the like the fancier masks might be a better option for you. But overall, surgical masks in the community, I think, are very protective. And then the most protective would be an N95. But we generally would reserve those for patients or for people who are healthcare workers um, who are seeing COVID patients all the time. Thank you. And actually, Dr. Yunus, I wanted to direct the next question to you. What would you say uh, to someone who asks, what do I do about the fear of missing out? <laughs> FOMO. FOMO. I mean, to be fair, we're all in that boat. We're all missing out on things that we weren't able to do, things that we wish we could have done. Um, I think every, I mean, both Dr. Trojo and Dr. Hose gave, gave you guys some really good things to practice. I also practice gratitude. I try to do it daily. And that's how I keep myself from getting FOMO. If I can just list off in my head a few things that I, that make me happy or that I'm grateful for in my head, um, it helps me kind of reset in a way. So I would say, find what works for you in terms of what keeps you grounded. Thank you. So the next question we have is, uh, how do you balance school and mental slash physical health? This is open to all three of you guys. That's a great question. Oh, wow. yeah, that's a good one. Um, I would say uh, routine is always good. Uh, I mentioned before creating a plan, putting in, you know, when I say creating a plan, I actually really do literally mean creating a plan, like taking the time out to sit down and map out a process, you know, a process that works for you that, you know, really kind of forces you to engage something 
with regularity. Again, whether it's daily, every other day, whatever you can do, but uh, commitment, it creates commitment. It creates a uh, sort of a conditioning, if you will, so that, you know, you, you start to expect uh, to do these things and it kind of becomes routine. Um, so uh, I would say physical fitness needs to be in there. Um, a balance of cardiovascular conditioning, so like long distance running, um, as well as sort of weight training or, you know, something similar. Uh, or you could do like, you know, kind of more of the, the yoga style or Pilates style, again, where you're kind of getting a little bit of both. Um, but regular fitness is, is really important. Doing things you enjoy mm -hmm. uh, throughout, you know, your days is really important to kind of like keep a balance. And uh, obviously school has got to be your priority. So no matter what, you want to make sure that you are dedicating yourself to uh, whatever it is that, that you're, you're assigned to. And uh, yeah. for every day you're working on that. I guarantee if you're able to do the smarter goals, like we talked about before and, and kind of outline your, your, the future for yourself and then do gratitude and these grounding exercises to stay in the moment. Cause ultimately you want to have aim and direction, but you want to enjoy the process or at least at the very least you want to be present throughout the process. So that involves everything we've talked about that involves making time for things that you enjoy. Even if you're overloaded with studying, maybe take a 15 minute break. If you enjoy going on Instagram, scroll through Instagram, although that I would argue is mindless. So just try to really be present in the moment and then, and then do your best to be present during the process, knowing that you have already set goals. All right. Thank you. And so this is our second and last question. And again, I'm going to direct this to Dr. Eunice because you have one of the most experiences with masks. How do you, how do I tell, this is a question someone sent in. How do I tell someone to wear a mask without feeling like they'll hate me? Oh, well, you know, you can't really control how other people might feel about you. Um, <laughs> uh, but I've done this myself um, going, you know, when there's no easy answer to this. You can just ask nicely, to be quite honest, and just try and be as non-judgmental as possible. Just say, hey, do you mind just covering up your nose? I notice a lot of people while working, they'll just tug their mask past mm -hmm. their nose and their nose is exposed. Just say, if you don't mind, can you please cover your nose? And just say it in a nice, non-threatening way. The problem is our climate is so politically charged and masks have become a divisive issue when they shouldn't be. This is just a public health measure aside from politics. So just try and be as kind as possible to each other. That's all I can say. It's cool uh, to be kind. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So our last question before we open the floor to everyone else. Um, also, I noticed the, the chat feature is now enabled. So everyone should be able to ask questions. Um, I think Dr. Hose, I actually want you to take this. Can you touch upon positive psychology topics such as resilience and grit? Hmm. Yeah. Resilience. Um, I, I love that topic. Um, resilience is a fancy word in some ways, but it really just kind of comes down to our ability to maintain balance and flexibility despite challenges. So challenges are a given in life, right? There's no life out here that's not going to at some point in time experience some adversity, uh, you know, some sort of situation where you have to, you know, perform at a higher level or where you experience a disappointment, any of those things. And resilience is basically a, a state of mind in which you can get through that, whatever that is, uh, and bounce back without setback, right? Or, you know, if you're, uh, you know, um, I think a stud, you know, you'll not only get through it, but you'll come out even better. And, you know, I think that these techniques that we've talked to today are really all about acquiring resilience. So I want to I want to say not just resilience, but wellness as well. Wellness is to me optimization of health physically, emotionally and intellectually. Um, and so we want the emotional wellness and we want the mental resilience. Those are the goals. And these are the things that mental fitness can provide. Awesome. So. Again, we're going to open this to the floor. Any questions anyone has, feel free to use the chat or you can raise your hand. You so I, I have a question that someone wrote. Um, 
Is there, do you have any tips or advice on how to increase confidence in your performance? So yeah. Armin, you want to take, or I, I can, I can no, answer this. It, so it's kind of what we talked about before, depending on what the performance is, obviously I think practicing this performance or practicing this craft as much as possible is ideally going to give you the confidence that you need. It's nice to have some sort of objective data to look at, whether you are taking practice exams or you're, you're practicing your free throws at the free throw line. If you can look at your, your percentage at the, after each practice exam or after every hundred free throws. And if you slowly see that percentage going up, that will ideally give you more and more confidence, the more you practice it. Um, ideally you want that confidence to come from within, but if you have someone that you trust um, in your social circle, that wants to watch you perform or, or wants to grade you or give you some sort of feedback, then ask for that feedback from somebody you trust. And that could also be a confidence booster as well. But the, I think the most important thing would be to continue to practice it as much as possible. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I want to add to that. Um, I think that another cornerstone for confidence is communication, right? Communication. Communication is sort of a key to confidence and that's, you know, self, talk really you know what Tori's really saying is when you're, when you're practicing you're really kind of having an internal dialogue right that creates reliability you know something you can believe in something you can depend on and fall back on when you're in the performance you know any athletes out there if you've practiced well you've prepared the right way you're going to have confidence you know and and Practice is all about self-talk. You know, you're talking yourself through it. You're visualizing and you're performing the way that you want to actually do it in real time. Um, but then also, if you're in team sports, it's, you know, communicating with others around you, right? Your teammates, you guys, you know, connecting with one another in terms of achieving a common goal. And even if you're not an athlete, you know, staying in touch with, we talked about earlier, gratitude, staying in touch with your loved ones, communicating right? Letting people know what's going on with you and then also listening actively and, and, and asking your loved ones and friends, mm -hmm. hey, what's going on with you? Communicating. These things build confidence. Yeah. It's all about being vulnerable and honest with yourself and with other people in order to know your weaknesses and then you strengthen those weaknesses. And through that, you'll have true confidence. And to know yourself. Do we have any other questions? I think we had someone who was going to raise their hand. Oh. Oh, I think she oh, wrote Oh, sorry, Savannah. Um, Awesome. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah loud and clear. Absolutely. Thank you. Yay, thank you. Um, so you guys might have noticed we had a lot of people from Castleton in here. Um, I'm the graduate assistant for the Castleton softball team, and a lot of the athletic department wanted to get our student athletes in here. Welcome. I think about four or five, thank you. I think about four or five of our girls are still in here. Um, but this is coming from more of a coaching perspective. Um, you know, how can we best how can I best support my athletes through this, you know, without overstepping my boundaries, but also, you know, reasonably keeping track of them and, you know, understanding where they're at mentally and physically. Uh, we just ended practice last week. So this is becoming more of a concern because we kind of let them go and it we're, we're worried about them. So we don't get yeah. to see. Them. You know, when I was in yeah. residency, uh, Tori, Tori and I were in residency together. Um, which is our basically our training program for psychiatry to help us learn the rudiments and fundamentals of psychiatry. And one of the really cool things uh, that we did in that program was we had what's called a process group. Mm -hmm. And a process group was, you know, getting together. There's only 10 of us in a room uh, and really just kind of, oh, it was always like a topic of discussion of, you know, the day and just kind of going around the room and giving each person an opportunity to share what was on their minds, on, on their hearts. And, you know, no one else was going to, you know, necessarily respond. It was just giving them an opportunity to just kind of say what they needed to say. And, uh, and then the other person, you know, would then share what they needed to share and, and just kind of having a, you know, a supportive ear uh, and people that you knew you could sort of trust um to be there for you it created a huge bond it's not something that really happens just in one session it's something you kind of have to do with regularity maybe every week but just a safe creating a safe place and a safe space for people to be able to share what's on their 
their hearts and minds in confidence, you know, without like fear that it's going to get out, you know, into the community or get outside of that room. That's a, a good way to, I think, uh, to, to cope together. Okay. I wanted to add to that. And thanks for answering that or asking that question, Savannah and shout out to Castleton University. You guys are the Spartans. Mm -hmm. Go Spartans. All right. So I think, I think I, ideally, yes, you have that um, kind of group um, meeting where everyone can be open with each other and, and talk about issues like that. But I also think it's very important because sometimes you don't want to share with a, even with your teammates, mm -hmm. even with your closest friends. So I think it's important to, as a coach, um, and maybe one, one of the coaches is designated to do this, just to have a consi consistent times where you check in with each individual player separately. Mm -hmm. And this could be as simple as, hey, how's it going? Um, and then what you want to do is you, you want to, the, the individual, the athlete is the person that needs to kind of take the lead. You don't want to force someone to talk about something if they're not ready to talk about. So that's why I think a weekly or however so often you guys schedule it, check in with each individual just to say, hey, how are you doing? Is there anything that I could help you with? you have any questions? I think it's a great jumping off point. Um, certainly, if, if there's anything more um, severe going on, then you, you, I'm sure you guys have connections with the kind of counseling center there at the school. Yeah, I work, I work pretty close with wellness uh, for quite a few of my athletes. I'm the person on our staff that handles most of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we do have connections with them and we make sure that they have their resources when they need it. Awesome. Um, do you yeah. guys implement any uh, of these grounding exercises or any mindfulness into your, your practices? So I have practiced grounding with my own mental health. Mm -hmm. but I have not taken anything into consideration with maybe working with the girls or, you know, going over it with them. So I'm really happy that you guys are sending that information out uh, because I will take that and try to do something with it for our team at a minimum. And it's good for them to just have it on their own. Absolutely. If you, if anyone watched the last dance was that documentary about the Chicago bulls and Michael Jordan, the goat, they actually, Phil Jackson would have them do um, uh, yoga and practices so they would do their their mindfulness they also went around and did a gratitude exercise um, after their last title so um, it's if it's good enough for the the best team in the history of sports then it should be good enough for everyone absolutely awesome Desaad. does anyone else have any questions we got another one yeah so real quick um i know a lot of students at uh, Long Island University from where I'm from, they're having a tough time with kind of moving on from sports. So I guess my question is um, that student athletes spend um, years of their lives being defined as a student athlete. How would you recommend moving on from collegiate sports in a positive way to find a new identity? That is a great question as well, because as you guys have probably known, watching famous athletes, sometimes they sputter after their careers end. Um, but that's what we normally see. What we what we don't see is that a lot of us, including myself, I wanted to play professional sports. My, my career ended a lot earlier. Didn't even make it past high school. So a, a lot of times, what that ideally involves is is starting at the kind of like I guess for you at college, it would be starting freshman year to kind of have an orientation where you talk about being more well balanced and having other interests and other hobbies. Um, but for, and, and ideally you, you have something to fall back on when you do, um, when your sports career inevitably ends because they, they always do end. So I think making sure to, to have um, a very well-balanced life. And at the end of the day, you have a leg up. Athletes specifically and the athletes that play in college have a leg up on other individuals because there's so many good lessons that you learn through playing sports. And the fact that you were able to make it into college and play um, at that kind of high level is going to bode well um, for any avenue you go into after sports. So you want to keep um, the ideal situation is you transition that, that work ethic that you had through sports, that ability to communicate with others if you're playing a team sport, like you mentioned, and transition it to something else. Awesome. Thank you for that question. Do we have uh, any other questions? I think that's it. So first of all, Thank you to everyone that stayed with us throughout the show. I don't know how that <laughs> hacked. I, I put it in a bunch of security measures before the show. 
and I, I really don't know what happened, and I'm really sorry it happened, but I really appreciate everyone who stayed through this show. I hope that everyone was, a, was able to learn something, and you're able to apply what, you, what was learned and discussed in the show into your everyday life. So we'll be sending out emails that include the mental and sleeping exercise templates, along with a quick survey regarding your experience, but hopefully you can uh, forget the hacking experience. <laughs> Um, as a reminder, Coping with COVID in College will soon be posted as episode 51 of Sports Like MDs, available on Spotify, Apple Music, and SoundCloud. Make sure to check us out, subscribe, rate, and leave a review. For more information on us and ways to stay mentally fit, check out our, web- check out our website at sportslikemds.com. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Sports Like MDs. If you have any questions, you can email me at Benjamin at Sports Like MDs, Dr. Hose at Armin at Sports Like MDs or Dr. Trogio Tori at Sports Like MDs. Thank you, everyone, and good luck with the rest of your academic and athletic year. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Um.